dollars, not five hundred thousand dollars. That, George Costanza, is shrinkage, right? <laughs> uh, I am going down to only a twenty-five thousand dollar expense, and that leaves me seven hundred seventy-five thousand dollars that I can take over to one sixty-eight k. But one sixty-eight k is going to say, "Sorry, I don't exist anymore. You don't get another bonus depreciation." So I'm going to be stuck with only taking twenty percent of my remaining seven hundred seventy-five thousand uh, dollars. And my calculator broke this morning when I tried to get it to do that because I said, "Hey, you're using molten, you're using the X." sign now, and I don't know how to do that. Uh, but that's not nearly as much as what I was getting when I was able to expense $680,000 in the year in which I placed the property into service. So theoretically, if you're worried about the potential sunset, you might want to tell your client who's looking for advice about whether to purchase depreciable property this year or next year to do it this year, because at least we know this is the game plan for this year. Will it be extended for yet another year? Eh, who knows? The British website isn't taking any action on that. So I can't at least tell you what your odds are on that particular one, but uh, at least we'll know uh, going forward. One other thing that AFRA did, this is up at the top now of page four, are, is to continue uh, just for theoretically just through the end of this year, but this has been it with us since 2006, and there's decent reason to believe that it would continue, but it is at least still in play for this year. Uh, deductions of so-called qualified conservation real property. Uh, prior to 2006, if I was to donate one of these conservation easements that is used either because you know I have some rare owl that lives on my property, or I have wetlands, or I have something that is ecologically significant, or even in some cases I have property that's located in a historic section of town, uh, and so what I will do is I will donate to a historic preservation organization something called a facade easement, where I will agree not to change the exterior of the property without the express written consent of the easement holder, which is this charitable organization that's all about uh, historical preservation. I get an income tax deduction for that donation of qualified conservation real property. How many of you have had clients that have done one of these? There's usually a few hands, but boy, there should be a lot more. Because this, my friends, this is money for nothing and your chicks for free. Okay? Uh, you will not find a better boondoggle available in your Internal Revenue Code today. Read both volumes, and if you find the better boondoggle, let me know. And for those of you who paid no registration fee, I will give you your money back <laughs> on that deal. Uh, why? Well, first thing what AFTRA does, nor prior to 2006, if I made one of those conservation easement deductions or facade easement contributions to a charity, I would get an income tax deduction. And if it's a capital asset, I get a deduction, of course, for the fair market value of that easement. And by the way, we typically measure the value of the easement as being the value of the property before you granted the easement minus the value of the property now that the easement has attached. Because that loss in value, the fact that this now binds the property in perpetuity, is going to make it less attractive to a potential buyer. So to the extent the value of the property has diminished, you get an income tax deduction for that. Now under the old rules, the maximum amount that I could take in the year of contribution would be up to 30% of my adjusted gross income. And if I happen to have, say, large amounts of ranch land, that I donate a conservation easement on and say, this property will only be used for ranching purposes. It will never be turned into golf courses. It will never be turned into strip malls. It will never be turned into a meth lab or anything that could be infinitely more productive than its use right now as ranch land. If I've got a whole lot of ranch land that I am binding in perpetuity, I can get a pretty big deduction there, right? And if I'm limited to 30% of my AGI, eh, I don't get it all this year, and I can carry it over, but I can only carry it over for five years. Even with a five-year carryover, I might not get the full bang for my buck. So what the Pension Protection Act of 2006 did, which after is extending for another year, is to increase those limitations to say you can take it up to 50% of your adjusted gross income in any one year, and instead of a five-year carryover, you get a 15-year carryover of any suspended charitable deduction. That's usually fat enough to at least provide a lot of taxpayers with years of substantial deductions where 50% of their adjusted gross income is going to be eliminated like that. Now, think of this. I'm a rancher. I have ranch land. I've had the ranch within the family for generations, despite the presence of an estate tax. Uh, I have, you know, I've managed this well. This is going to stay in the family, as far as I'm concerned, for a long time. Uh, my new son doesn't know it yet, but he's going to be a rancher, right? It's going to stay there for a long time. 
What am I doing to get this deduction? I am saying to a charitable organization, I promise that I will only continue to use the land as I have been using it for the rest of my life. Uh, or if I live in a historically significant portion of the country, I live in Old Town in Santa Fe, New Mexico, for example, and I donate a conservation easement to a local historical preservation organization in Santa Fe, and I say, I promise I will not change the adobe exterior to this particular building without your express written consent. Well, maybe, maybe I purchased the property there in historic Santa Fe because I want to have a property that has that kind of exterior, and I'm not buying it with the intent to then turn it into some art deco eyesore. Uh, I'm buying it because I want to own a piece of historically significant land, and I wouldn't dream of changing the exterior anyway. And yet, if I commit myself to that, and if I commit the land to it in perpetuity, I'm getting an income tax deduction for agreeing to do something I wouldn't do anyway, right? I promise, Internal Revenue Service, I will never skydive, and you'll give me a $1,000 charitable deduction. Fine! Send me, sign me up for it. The hell if I'm ever skydiving, right? Uh, so, you know, that's just not going to happen. I go ahead and I get my deduction. It's the same thing here. And the thing is, you're getting a deduction that's based upon the impact of the value. Who really feels the burden of that easement? It's not you, the one who wouldn't do it anyway. It's successive owners of the property who will be handcuffed <coughs> if they're doing anything else with that property. They're the ones that feel the burden, but you get the income tax deduction. That's awesome. Right? I get the deduction and other people feel the pain. They incurred the cost. So I don't know why people wouldn't do this. This is just awesome. Well, go figure. The service is kind of paying attention to some of these deductions because, all right, pigs get fed but hogs get slaughtered, right? Some taxpayers, it's not enough that they're getting their money for nothing and their chicks for free here. They have to try to get as much as they possibly can. And we've got a series of cases that are coming up here in the materials that I want to talk about because you're going to see that there's sort of three things that the service is focusing on if you're going to have a client do one of these qualified conservation contributions. They are focusing first, of course, on valuation because go figure, taxpayers experts and the services experts are disagreeing as to the economic impact of attaching one of these conservation easements onto property. Number two, the service is looking at situations where, according to the service, the property is not being subject to the easement in perpetuity. One of the conditions to getting the deduction is that that easement has to attach to the property in perpetuity. Now, I know perpetuity is not something you talk about much in South Dakota, right? Uh, you try to get rid of it. Uh, but, you know, this is a rule for perpetuity, so I think everybody here should be on board with it. Okay? Uh, you want it to attach to the property in perpetuity, and it's all good. And then, of course, lastly, they're looking at situations where it looks like there's more of a quid pro quo transaction as opposed to a real charitable contribution. Uh, let's start with a basic valuation case on pages four and five. This is the bottom of page four and at the top of page five. Uh, it's the memorandum decision from the tax board, Scheidelman versus commissioner from January of this year. Uh, here's a taxpayer who had donated a facade easement. Uh, and you'll notice, by the way, uh, in the materials here, when you get your copy of the materials, uh, you will see that there is, every time when there is reference to the facade here, you'll notice that there's that little tail hanging from the sea, like a little snake sticking out. Uh, that's called a sedilla, for those of you that are new to that little form of punctuation. Uh, and that's very key if you're going to claim one of these deductions, because it turns out when you go get an appraisal, uh, a facade easement fetches a lot more than a facade easement. So uh, having the sedilla there is something helpful. You don't know that, but that was A-level material. <laughs> All right. So the taxpayer lives in a historically significant section of Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, I wondered about that, too. But it lives in a historically significant section of Brooklyn, has a townhouse there, and grants to the National Architecture Trust a facade easement under which he promises, I will never change the exterior of the townhouse without the express written consent of Major League Baseball and the National Architecture Trust. Now, the National Architecture Trust, you're going to see their name here in quite a few of these cases, because in the middle of the last decade, the National Architecture Trust went around marketing facade easements to people who lived in historically significant sections of the country to say, hey, you can get one of these big easements here for promising not to do anything that you wouldn't already do, uh, and you get a big old income tax deduction, we'll help you set it up. 
uh, in these cases. So National Architecture Trust approached the taxpayer. Taxpayer goes ahead and grant, gives one of these facade easements. Uh, they then hire an appraiser to determine what's the fair market value of the easement. And here's what the appraiser does. The appraiser says, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to appraise the townhome. Here's the value of the townhome. And then the appraiser does some research and finds that pretty consistently the service is allowing taxpayers to be able to claim that the value of the easement is about 10 to 15 percent of the value of the underlying property. So the expert said, fine, we'll just go ahead and say that the value of this easement is 10 percent, a little bit more than 10 percent of the value of the underlying property. Since this is the value of the underlying property times 10 percent, bingo, here's the value of your easement. And as you can see, the taxpayer claims a $115,000 charitable contribution deduction. The service attacks this on the grounds that that is not a qualified appraisal. Because remember, what the appraisal is appraising is the easement. Now, yes, the easement itself may be a function of the underlying property, and it's right to consider the underlying property. But the service was taking the position that when you just say 10% times the value of the property is the value of the easement, you're not really looking into the peculiar characteristics of that particular easement. Uh, and easements can vary from one to the other. And so we don't think it's enough. We think it's sloppy to just say 10% times the value of the underlying property is going to work. It went to the tax court the first time around, and the tax court agreed. No, qualified appraisal has to do more than just simply apply a blind fixed percentage to the value of the underlying property. The taxpayer appealed the case to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, though. And the Second Circuit Court of Appeals said, what's wrong with that? I mean, they did value the underlying townhome, and it's perfectly reasonable to be able to say that because historically the value of the easement has fluctuated between 10 and 15 percent of the subject property, to then say, well, this appraiser chose 10 percent because, in fact, the appraiser did say, I chose 10 percent instead of 15 percent because of the unique characteristics of this particular property. He went on the low end in appraising it. Second Circuit says that seems enough to us to be a qualified appraisal. We think you're okay. So they remanded the case down because the service said, well, wait a minute, we didn't get the opportunity to talk about whether this easement really lasts in perpetuity. We didn't get to talk about the quid pro quo. All we focused on was the appraisal element, and there may be other flaws. So the Second Circuit sent it back down with an instruction to the tax court that said, no, you'll accept that appraisal. That appraisal is perfectly fine. You need to decide these other elements. <laughs> So what did the tax court do? The tax court said, yeah, okay, we'll accept that appraisal, but we also have to consider the government's appraisal too. And the government's appraisal found that there was no loss in value to the property whatsoever. And the tax court said, while the Second Circuit has told us that we have to now consider the taxpayer's appraisal, we consider it, but we like the services appraisal better, and we think that there's still no charitable income tax deduction. So even though the Second Circuit said, accept that appraisal and focus on the other elements, the tax court still couldn't get past the fact that it thought the government's appraisal was better because the government's appraisal used other comparable properties that were within Brooklyn, whereas the taxpayer in establishing the base value of the underlying property wasn't using other Brooklyn townhomes to be able to establish the value. And when they were talking about the percentage to be applied, the percentage to be applied was based upon a sample nationwide and not one that focused, again, more closely on Brooklyn itself. The services expert was more Brooklyn focused in the appraisal, and so the service ends up winning. There's a really fun case then that comes underneath this. It's the right one underneath it here, uh, Belk versus Commissioner, that was reviewed by the entire tax court. Uh, here, it sounds so virtuous. The taxpayer donates a conservation easement uh, uh, to the Smoky Mountain National Land Trust out in North Carolina. Uh, and it's 180 acres that are going to be encumbered with this. Uh, the taxpayer presently uses the 180 acres as a golf course. And the terms of the conservation easement provide that in perpetuity, this property can be used for nothing but a golf course. Uh, wow, isn't that giving uh, on the part of the taxpayer a real sacrifice that in perpetuity this shall always be a golf course? Uh, well, what was interesting about this particular appraisal, uh, or about this particular situation, the taxpayer has the 180 acres over here uh, that on which the golf course runs and operates. We'll call that Parcel A. Immediately next to Parcel A is Parcel B, also owned by the taxpayer, not currently a golf course sitting on it, but it's another relatively sizable portion of land. Not quite as big as the 180 acres, but still a pretty big chunk of land that's right there. Okay? Uh, you'll notice that the donation agreement between the Smoky Mountain National Land Trust and the taxpayer 
has a clause that says that if the taxpayer wants to, the taxpayer can remove the easement from parcel A and have it carry over instead to parcel B. Right? So that in perpetuity, there will always be a parcel of property that is subject to this easement. It's just that the particular property subject to that easement can change at the discretion of the taxpayer. Well, the taxpayer then claims a very modest $10.5 million income tax deduction for the value of that. Because when you say you can only use it for golf course purposes, you're taking a real hit uh, on the value of that property. $10.5 million worth in perpetuity. So that gets the service's attention. And the service says, uh, wait a minute, the perpetuity requirement would require that the easement attach to that particular parcel in perpetuity, not that there just be an easement in perpetuity that can float around and apply to various types of land. In effect, what the taxpayer was trying to do, you know how with grantor trusts, we often have that power to substitute assets, the so-called swap power, which we use to be able to get the step up in basis in the moments before death and all kinds of fun stuff. And if nothing else, it at least qualifies our trust as being an income tax grantor trust, which is generally good. Swap power is there, perfectly normal, perfectly healthy. But a swap power here in the conservation easement setting? Uh-uh. -oh, that's a sin. That one's not going to fly. Uh, and sure enough, the tax court agrees with the service that you, know, you, know, you have to encumber a particular piece of property in perpetuity, not just some property to be defined or that is capable of being swapped. Uh, bottom of page five and on the top of page six, the Pollard case. This one is kind of a fun one. It's only two lines at the top of page five, so maybe we'll go at the top of page six, so maybe we'll just focus on the bottom of page five. This one's pretty straight over tackle. Uh, the taxpayer tried to be able to get a zoning variance from the local commission so that he could erect uh, a residence on property that he had just purchased. Uh, and the member, two members of the planning board come to him and say, you know, it would really help your application off a lot if you agreed to donate a conservation easement uh, on top of that because then that would look to us like you're a very solid citizen and we'd be more than happy to approve your application. The taxpayer being no dummy donates a conservation easement on the same property. And go figure, the service says, then your conservation easement really isn't a charitable donation. It's a quid pro quo. You were giving the easement in exchange for a zoning variance or for more favorable treatment under the zoning variance. Goes before the tax court. The tax court has no problem tossing it out, saying, that's right, that was a quid pro quo. There wasn't really a charitable contribution that was going on. Uh, I love, uh, we'll skip the, the one about the landfill in Tucson. Uh, it's fascinating, but not especially more about bargain sale and charity there. Uh, instead, at the bottom of page six and the top of page seven, here you had a taxpayer who had 882 acres of land in California. What did he do with the 882 acres? He used it for deer hunting. With 882 acres, the deer's got a decent shot. Okay? So he uses it for recreational deer hunting purposes. Uh, and donates a conservation easement to the Golden State Land Conservancy upon which he promises that no structure shall ever be built, the property shall never be subdivided, it will always stay as nice, happy, healthy, raw land. And he ends up claiming, as you see there, a $4.7 million deduction for the loss and the value of that 882 acres by so committing it. Uh, the service disputes the value, and when the taxpayer is brought into tax court or goes to tax court uh, to contest the asserted deficiency, uh, the taxpayer comes with not one, but with two different variations. Because remember, when you're valuing real property, you value it according to its highest and best use, and not necessarily according to its actual use, right? That's something that we're all familiar with. So the taxpayer here says, I got two better uses of the property, two that could be a highest and best use that's better than the recreational deer hunting that I'm doing with it now. Says, number one, highest and best use, that property could be a winery. Okay? Uh, and boy, if that thing were a winery, how valuable that would be. But nope, it's not going to be now, so I get a big old fat income tax deduction. Uh, but in fact, <laughs> the tax court judge says, huh. Uh, well, that's interesting because in order to access your land, you have an easement over federal land. And the easement over federal land grants you use only for single family residential purposes and for personal purposes. It doesn't allow an easement for ingress or egress for business purposes. How exactly are you, you know, are you helicoptering in and out uh, the necessary supplies to be able to conduct your winery? We don't even think it's good. Oh, and by the way, there's no water on the land and no ready source of water to the land. And as it turns out, you make better wine with healthy grapes than with raisins. 
So we really don't think that this is going to be suitable as a winery. We're tossing out the highest and best use as a winery. Fine, says the taxpayer, I've got another big use here, and that is I could always turn it into a residential subdivision. And I could subdivide, I could sell it off, I could develop it all as real estate. That gives me a higher and better use that justifies a big old fat income tax deduction. Yeah, the problem is, is that there's state law that prohibits residential subdivision along the property that's already in play. So if you're going to talk about a highest and best use, it can't be in fantasy land. It has to be a highest and best use that would actually be legal for the property. So go figure the taxpayer ends up losing there uh, too. Uh, this one is kind of fun. This is where National Architecture Trust is really getting in trouble. This is at the bottom of page 7 and on the top of page 8, the grade case from the tax court. Taxpayer again has New York City property, donates a facade easement to the National Architecture Trust. The national, now, the reason why this particular taxpayer found out about this was because his neighbor did the same thing the year before. And the neighbor was talking at a poker party, because that's how these conservation easement things come out, right? What have you been up to? Well, you've got a big old fat income tax deduction. You won't believe it. And now all of a sudden the neighbor's like, well, you know. WTF, I want in on this too. Right? <laughs> so they get together with the National Architecture Trust and they're like, yeah, I want to do one of these. And the National Architecture Trust is like, yeah, this is awesome, this is fun. If you're kind of wondering what's in it for the National Architecture Trust to be doing this besides fulfilling its charitable purpose, National Architecture's Trust request is that there be a cash donation that accompanies the conservation easement and that the cash donation be worth 10% of the estimated income tax deduction. And at first, National Architecture Trust was saying that 10% donation is for us to help administer the easement. Uh, but then when the service started saying, well, then that doesn't make it sound like a charitable contribution, they just said, well, we now just solicit it as a donation, uh, that you give us a cash donation. So the taxpayer was like, all right, I'll give you this facade easement and I'll give you this donation. But my neighbor here tells me that you guys had a provision in the donation agreement that said that if the income tax deduction is challenged successfully and that there is no income tax deduction that's granted to my neighbor, you'll give him his easement back. I want that same provision in my agreement, that if I don't get an income tax deduction, I get the property back. National Architecture Trust Trust said, fine, we'll go ahead and do that. So the taxpayer then uh, makes the donation of the easement. They value the easement at being $990,000, which seems suspiciously like under a million, right? As if they were trying to fly below some non-existent radar that would only go off at one million feet. Uh, but they claim $990,000 in income tax deduction, and of course they then make a cash donation of $99,000 to go along with it. Service, sure enough, steps up and disallows the deduction. Why? That's a conditional gift. If your gift is, here's the conservation easement, but if it turns out I don't get a deduction for it, I get it back, you've expressly tagged a condition onto your gift. And yeah, the Internal Revenue Code says that you don't get an income tax deduction for conditional gifts. They have to be absolute, 100% completed gifts before you get an income tax deduction. So the service says, that's a conditional gift. So then the taxpayer was trying to say, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, this one was not a conditional gift because I get where you're coming from. But under New York law, if you don't record the condition with the deed, it's ineffective under state law. New York law would require that in order for that easement to be a conditional grant, the condition would have to be stated in the easement that is actually recorded. The conditional clause was in our donation agreement. The donation agreement was never filed with the state of New York, and so therefore it's unenforceable and it shouldn't count against us. It was a pretty clever, albeit desperate, argument that the taxpayer was making. But the court said, yeah, but there was a provision in the easement that was recorded that was talking about how the charity can surrender its right under the easement. And your donation agreement makes it pretty clear that if there is no income tax deduction, National Architecture Trust is contractually obligated to surrender its right under the easement. That surrender right is in the recorded deed, so therefore we think New York would enforce that particular clause. Ruh -roh. Um, so then the taxpayer says, oh yeah, but there's this rule buried in the regulations of 1.178-14G. And that will have that spirit. Uh, that, that little rule that's buried within the regulation there says that uh, we can ignore conditions that are so remote as to be negligible, right? Uh, that if the chances of that conditioning happening are so remote as to be negligible, we can disregard the condition. 
And the taxpayer says, the fact that we would ever exercise that clause was so we're going to be negligible, because take my word for it, I never would have intended to invoke that particular clause. And the taxpayer said, well, if that's so, why did you insist on having that clause inside of the agreement? It obviously meant something to you, and it had to be more than a negligible risk for you to make sure that it was specifically negotiated into the agreement. So the poor taxpayer kind of painted himself into a corner, and they end up getting no deduction whatsoever. Uh, there are some other cases along that line. You can see on page 8, there's another quid pro quo with the pesky case that's described on page 8. And on pages 8 and 9, there's another one of these perpetuities according to a termination clause uh, that was before the court in Carpenter. If you're sensing a theme here, we've talked about eight cases from the tax court and from federal district courts just since January of this year. This is something that the service investigates quite fully, is not afraid to litigate, and courts are siding with the service. So again, if you're going to do one of these, the main takeaway points. Number one, you want appraisals to be able to back up the valuation that you're claiming. You want them to be as thorough and as diligent an appraisal as money can buy for, and you probably want multiple appraisals to be able to support you in that particular case. Second, of course, is that you don't want there to be any evidence of any kind of quid pro quo, and you want to make sure that the easement is clearly attaching to the property in perpetuity. Things like substitution powers, things like cancellation powers in the event that you don't get a deduction, that's going to be fatal to your claim to be able to claim them. But otherwise, uh, there's plenty of other taxpayers that are doing this.